right. How many of you guys got enough sleep last night? How many of you had someone in your room that snored? Anyone like that? That's the worst. Those people shouldn't even be allowed to come to youth conference. All right, here's what we're going to do real quick. You guys can be seated. We're, you can be seated. We're going to play a quick game, true or false. You guys, I know some of your hero, childhood hero, and on the screen. So you just shout these out. What do you think is true or false? Let's uh, go to the first one. 99% of people can't lick their elbows. True. Anyone think they can? Can prove that otherwise? Maybe got a really short arm or something. Okay, that one is true. True. All right. Anyone get that wrong? <laughs> okay. Next. You use 43 different muscles to talk every time you talk. True or false? I'm going to say true. I'm going to say false. Okay. It is false. You use 72 different muscles every time you talk. All right, next one. A baby porcupine is called a porkler. I want you to think about this. How do I say true? How do I say false? All right, the correct answer is a porcupet. A porcupet. How many of you guys would like to have a porky pet as a pet? Sneak them into your siblings' room and stuff. Some hummingbirds weigh less than a grain of rice. How many say it true? How many say false? All right, how many of you have ever seen a grain of rice before? The answer is false. They do weigh less than a penny, though. All right, next one, next one. Chicks, as in the birds, can breathe through their shells. I'm going to say true. I'm going to say false. All right, answer is true. All right, let's look at the next one. Your eyes move about 700 times a second. I'm going to say true. False. Don't know, don't care. Anyone have a few? Ha oh, half you. Good. Uh, false. We move about 80 times a second. Next one. Next one. It is impossible to breathe and swallow at the same time. How many say true? False. And the correct answer is true. True, it is. All right. A blue whale's heart weighs up to 2,000 pounds. True? False? It is true. This is one big heart. All right. Star Wars creators designed Yoda to be like Yoda to be like Napoleon in front of heart. I would say true. I would say false. Answer is false. They want him to look like Albert Einstein. All right. Do we have any more? I think this is the last one. Your fingernails take eight months to grow from base to tip. True? False? Answer is false. They take about six months. So there you go. That's a little trivia. All right. How many of you guys are just still waking up? A little bit tired? Eight o'clock session. I know that's, that's very, very early. Um, Here's what I want to do. This doesn't have anything to do with uh, the, the message this morning, but these are a couple signs that were messages that were lost in translation. So just to kind of get our minds going. Uh, poisonous and evil rubbish. This, is, this doesn't have anything to do with anything. I just, I think they're funny, so I'm going to show them up here because I want it. Poisonous and evil rubbish. Next one. Uh, put out a hand, the water leakage. Puts out a hand of water leakage, all right? How many guys ever been to Asia before? All right, lost in translation. Next one. Uh, if the elevator is broken down, please call 9110. All right, next one. A nice electric shock. <laughs> okay. 
That's what some of you need this morning. A nice electric shock. Hand grenade. Close. Not quite, not quite. Uh, beware of invisibility. <laughs> That's a real problem in some places, all right? Uh, green grass is beautiful. Hope your foot give mercy. <laughs> also known as don't walk on the grass. Next one. Slip carefully. If you're going to slip, just slip carefully. Uh, next one. You are my love angle. Don't treat me like a potato, okay? Be a nice bumper sticker. And please, best one, do not empty your dog here, all right? I mean, you guys, it's your, your responsibility to, when your dog empties in the yard, you got to go clean it up. Anyone in here like that? That's terrible. All right. All right. So take your Bibles real quick and turn to the book of Hebrews, Hebrews chapter 11. And uh, last night was a great night to, a great start to our conference. And hopefully you were, you were listening and allowing the Lord to speak to you through the message that Dr. Getch brought and even the drama. I know God spoke to me, and uh, I'm looking forward, and we are praying and anticipating great things. While you're turning there to Hebrews chapter 11, I want to remind you, if, you, if your parents are in full-time Christian service, there's, there's a breakfast this next hour. Make sure that you uh, see your youth leader and get the details on that. Also, if you are a youth leader in here, we do have youth leader session. Uh, every time we have a session in here in the morning, we have a youth leader session. So you guys are welcome to attend those um, as, as you'd like. Hebrews chapter 11, and uh, just hold your place there. Let me give a little bit of context to what we're going to be talking about this morning. This morning I'd like to bring a message entitled, Before the Call. Before the Call. Uh, the conference theme this week is Higher Call. Last night you heard a message from Dr. Getch on God's calling in our lives. So you, and you'll hear a few more along the way. This is a big deal. This is the whole point. We have a conference like this. So hopefully some will come to know Christ and some will answer. Many hopefully will answer the call of God on their life. And so you'll hear a lot about that. And one thing that Dr. Getz said last night is that the calling of God is imminent. It's active. He's, he's calling us. He's calling us to service. He's calling us uh, to tell others about him. And, and God's calling in our life is real and it's active. But sometimes the conditions in our heart are not correct to hear that call. Sometimes God's calling, but, but we don't hear the call. Isaiah chapter 65 verse 12 spoke of this. It says, Therefore will I number you to the sword, and ye shall bow down to the slaughter. Because when I called, ye did not answer. When I spake, ye did not hear, because, but did evil before mine eyes, and did choose that wherein I delighted not. Okay, so the children of Israel, they were preoccupied with, with their own agenda going on in their lives that they could not hear when God called, they could not hear when God called, they just frankly weren't listening. And so we're going to talk this morning about uh, before the call, what conditions need to be right before the call. And to do that, we're going to look at the life of of Moses. Now, Moses had an incredible call. If you go study the call of Moses, he had what we call the burning bush experience, uh, an awesome phenomenon where God came and engulfed the bu bush, but it wasn't consumed, and he spoke to Moses. Even if you're not very familiar or haven't been to church uh, maybe your whole life, you've probably heard the story of Moses and the burning bush, and we think of that moment, man, sometimes we want moments like that where it's just such strong clarity that we know exactly what God wants us to do, but then oftentimes the reality is God is trying to speak to us, and we necessarily aren't listening. And so what we're going to look at in the next few verses here in Hebrews chapter 11 are some things that Moses did right before that burning bush experience, before that call came in his life. So look at verse number 24, Hebrews chapter 11. It says this, by faith Moses... When he was come to years, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, choosing rather to suffer affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season, esteeming the reproach of Christ greater riches than the treasures in Egypt, for he had re respect unto the recompense of the reward. By faith he forsook Egypt, not fearing the wrath of the king, for he endured as seen him who is invisible. 
Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, God, we thank you for this conference where we can come and open your word and prayerfully draw closer to you through something that we read and something that we study. I pray that you would do just that this morning uh, in this session. I know it's early, God. I pray that you would uh, keep uh, the teens in this room attentive. And, and Lord, I pray that you would speak and, and prayerfully help them as well. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, Dr. Getz said this as well last night. Uh, the, the, before you, you uh, focus on your calling, more important than that is, is the question, am I a Christian? Am I a believer? And the Bible talks that when we receive mercy, this is in 2 Corinthians uh, chapter number 4, when we receive mercy, we also receive a ministry. So I really strongly believe that if you are a child of God, God is calling you to be set apart from the world uh, for a specific service. Now, I know sometimes the confusion comes in when we try to understand, well, what is God's specific call for my life? And sometimes we understand generally that God calls us as Christians to be separate to be distinct, to tell others about Christ. But then sometimes, uh, to be honest, we can be confused in God's specific calling. How many of you guys have ever experienced that confusion? I'm not exactly sure what God would want me to do at some point. Maybe I've figured it out by now or I'm sure of it now, but you guys know what I'm talking about. Sometimes, and then it can be uh, more confusion. Who am I going to marry? Am I going to marry the right person? I don't want to marry the wrong person because then it's a whole chain reaction uh, of of bad things are going to happen in my life. And so, God's call, it's, it's something to be taken serious, but, but, but sometimes uh, as we seek to understand God's call, man, there's, there's aspects of it that can be confusing if our hearts are not right. And so when we receive mercy, when we ex- receive Christ, we are, we're given a call. But then, like I said, there are times where, where we, there are specific answers. We're trying to understand, God, what would you have for me? And I'll tell you this, the most important thing is this, that you are surrendered to do whatever we get, surrender to do and willing to do whatever God would have for your life. But I want you, I want you uh, to carefully take the notes this morning and ask yourself these four questions that we'll study together. These are four questions to settle in your heart. These are four questions that Moses settled in his heart before the call came. And so the first question is this. Will I accept my identity as a believer? Will I accept my identity as a believer? As a believer, okay? So if you're taking notes, write that down. And if you want to, underline or circle the word identity. Moses, if you're familiar with the story of Moses, Moses grew up as a child at the time of his birth. It was, it was uh, uh, some tragic events had taken place. And uh, the king, Pharaoh, was trying to control the population of the Jews who were in captivity. They were slaves. And so there was a decree that went out that that uh, many of the children, if they were male, were to be killed. And so God worked in a, in a, a special way to spare uh, Moses' life. And Moses found himself in the, in, the, in the throne room of the Pharaoh. He found himself growing up in Pharaoh's, Pharaoh's household. Pharaoh had, or Moses had, from this time forward, a luxur- luxurious and lavish and comfortable upbringing. The Bible tells us uh, that, that in, let's read verse number 24. Uh, it says this, when he came to years, uh, or verse number 23, but, but by faith, when he was born, he was hid three months of his parents because it's always a proper child and we're not afraid of the king's commandment. So his parents spare his life, and from that point forward, Moses grew up in luxury. He had everything he could have ever wanted. Uh, He had all the popularity, all the friendships, everything he could have ever desired growing up in Egypt there. Egypt at the time, it was the center of the world. It was the most sophisticated part of the world. It was where all the wealth was. It was where all the the power was. It was where the government was. And so Moses finds himself growing up in the king's house as a prince in Egypt and got to experience many of these luxuries. I I think of... uh, the king, uh, the, the, the king Tut, and how in 1922, I believe it was, they discovered King Tut's uh, burial, and, 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 and as they opened up his, his burial, they found all this, this gold, and the estimated value today in just the raw materials is, is over $750 million that was buried with this king. And you got to understand this. Moses lived within about 100 years of King Tut, and he, he lived in that luxury, and he had all the wealth, and he had all the money, and he had a very lavish upbringing. B- 
But Acts chapter 7, verse number 22, tells us this. He says, And Moses was learned in all the wisdom of the Egyptians and was mighty in words and deeds. What does that mean? It means that Moses was educated in the best schools. He was popular. He had powerful. It says that he had power in words and in deeds, meaning this. He could say something and it would be an enacted as law. He had power in words and in deeds. He was educated in the best school. This was the guy that seemed to have it all, and yet something was missing. You know what? Hardly a week goes by where you don't turn on the television and you hear of a celebrity that would seemingly from the outside have everything only to see that the reality is that their life is falling apart from the inside out because in what seemingly looks like everything really in reality apart from Christ is nothing. And so here Moses was and he's growing up in this environment where you could have everything and anything at your disposal but God began to do something in his heart. Acts 7.25 says this, uh, when, and when he was full, uh, full 40 years old, it came into his heart to visit his brethren, the children of Israel. And seeing one of them suffer wrong, he defended them and avenged him that was oppressed and smote the Egyptian, which was, was definitely wrong to do, acting outside of God's will. It says this, though, for he supposed his brethren would have understood how that God by his hand would deliver them, but they understood not. So Moses is approaching about 40 years of age, and God is starting to stir in his heart. He's starting to see some things. He's starting to connect some dots. He's starting to see that everything that looks so lavish and luxurious from the outside world was really quite empty to him. He was experiencing that emptiness, and he was searching, and he was trying to connect the dots and, and figure out what God... And he even knew something, and he was surprised that his brother didn't know. The verse tells us that God stirred in his heart, and he was faced with a decision... Who do I belong to? Who will I associate with? And his answer is found in verse number 24. Look at verse number 24. It says this. By faith Moses, when he was come to years, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter. Moses settled his identity. Will you accept your identity as a believer? When he was come to years, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter. Listen, if you are a child of God, purchased by the blood of Christ, why should your identity, who you identify with, be up for grabs? Why is that negotiable? When you stop and think of what Christ did for us on the cross and how he purchased us and what he's given to us, why do we have to think twice concerning who we identify with? And why are we so easily drawn to identify with the world? Listen, our, our issues with identity are based in acceptance. And like Dr. Getch talked about last night, we want to be accepted. And he even listened to music that he didn't necessarily like because he wanted to be acceptance, because he wanted to project an identity, and he wanted others to like him. Listen, now is the time as a 7th grader all the way up through 12th graders to understand who you are in Christ. And Ephesians chapter 1 is a great help in that, to understand who you are in Christ. Listen, as, as a child of God in Christ, I am an enemy of the devil. I am the salt of the earth. I am the light of the world. I am a child of God. I am a part of the true vine. I am Christ's friend. I am chosen and appointed by Christ to bear his fruit. I am enslaved to God. I am a slave of righteousness. I am a son of God. God is my spiritual father. I am joint heirs with Christ. I am a temple, the dwelling place of God. Are you guys awake this morning? That is who we are in Christ. That is what Christ has given us. And listen, we are accepted in the beloved, the Bible tells us. We are accepted by Christ. And we ought to, as believers, identify with, with Christ. We ought not be shy concerning the fact of who we are and what we believe, and where we belong, and how we behave, and how we dress, and how we identify ourselves with our Savior. Why is that so hard to do? Why is that such a struggle? We want to be popular. We want the acceptance. We want the identity. Moses settled his identity. This pivotal moment in his life, around 40 years of, old, of age, he had to decide, am I going to be a son of the true king, or am I going to be a son of Pharaoh's daughter? 
And, and he had to stop and evaluate because that was a tough decision to make. Am I going to identify with a bunch of slaves? Am I going to identify with this wealth and pagan lifestyle? And he had to settle his identity. And he made the correct decision. When he was come to years, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter. That identity meant he had to accept certain things and he had to reject certain things. And if you are going to accept your identity as a child of God, there are certain things that you are going to have to, as Moses did, refuse in your life. And there are other things that you're going to have to accept and hold to and cling to as a believer. Have you settled your identity? Listen, I'm talking about God's call here. So if there's any little bit of confusion, if you're not sure, is call, God calling or is God not calling? Listen, step back and settle your identity. Am I a child of God? And do I know who I am in Christ? So the first question is this. Will I accept my identity as a believer? The second question that Moses had to answer, and, and I want you to ponder this morning, is this. Will I establish my values based on God's word? Say this word with me. Values. values. Say it louder. Values. values. Let's say the first word. Identity. identity. So he had to know what his identity was, and then he had to establish his values, what things were valuable to him. I, heard, I read the story earlier this year about a lady who lived in Israel. She was cleaning out her mom's apartment and actually renovating her mom's apartment. And one of the things she did for her mother was buy her a new bed complete with mattress and everything. When her mom came home, she was hysterical. She was hysterical. She was upset. She was beside herself. Apparently, she had hidden her life savings of over $1 million in a mattress that her daughter threw out in a surprise renovation. What a bummer. <laughs> that would, I'd be upset if someone did that. We look at that and we say, man, that's a lot of money. That's a lot of value. I, I think we can all stop and say, man, that is a lot of value. Uh, that is certainly valuable. We would consider that valuable. But what would it take... What would it take for you to sell out on God? Moses, as we mentioned, had all the riches at his fingertips. And the Bible tells us very clearly here in this verse that he, he valued those far less than he valued his walk with God. Moses was uh, faced with this question in a very real way. Uh, verses 25 to 26 speak of the pleasures of sin and the riches of Egypt. And Moses had unlimited, unfiltered access to both. As much money as he could have ever needed to have around a, a new opportunity to sin and party, party around every corner without any supervision. He was his own man at this point in time. But he had to answer this question, what will I value? What will I value? And verse number 25 gives us the answer. Choosing rather to suffer affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season. To Moses, it was better to suffer and be in the will of God than to experience pleasure outside of God's will. And the pleasure that you do experience if you choose to pursue pleasure outside of God's will, the Bible tells us is very short-lived, is for a season. It's temporary. So Moses saw both extremes. He saw the extreme wealth, and he saw the extreme lavish lifestyle. But I'm going to tell you this. He saw the extreme sin as well. And along with that, he saw extreme emptiness. And he had to step back and say, what will I value? Can I tell you, our values as a society are completely upside down. As a whole, completely uh, opposed to what God values, to biblical values. And listen, now is the time as a high schooler, as a junior high, to dive into God's word and see what God has to say about certain matters and issues of life and understand what you value. Listen, if you try to figure that out your first year at a freshman college somewhere at a secular university, it's too late. If you try to figure out that first day of your job when you're, when you're offered something or a joke is told or something is suggested, it's too late then. Will you establish your values on God's word? Moses established his values. Verse number 26 says this, esteeming 
That means with careful thought, meaning he evaluated his circumstance, esteeming the reproach, the ridicule, the persecution. And oftentimes we're like, yeah, I would, but then this would happen. Listen, Moses, esteeming the reproach of Christ, greater riches than the treasures in Egypt, for he had respect or he had value unto the recompense of the reward. So Moses stepped back and says, listen, suffering with Christ, the one who I, I, whom I identify with, suffering with Christ, my creator, is more value to, valuable to me than anything that the world has to, op, to offer. Will I establish my values based on God's word? I think we're in bad shape concerning our generation. Our generation. I use that term lightly because I know there's an age gap between me and you, but I'm, I'm, similar, I'm more similar to you in age than some of the other speakers, so I'll go ahead and use it. Let's talk about our generation. Can I tell you what we value? We value things that are just meaningless. You've got, you've got the world teaching opposing values. You go to your school. You believe that God created the earth. You believe that marriage is between man and a woman. You'll be taught otherwise at your school. You'll be ridiculed, you'll be mocked because of it. So the values that are taught are opposing to the values that are, that are given to us in Scripture. But you know what, above and beyond that, I believe that our generation has, has valued things that are just simply meaningless. I'll give you one example, and, and I ask you to use um, some maturity as I give you this example. The, many of you have heard the, uh, the, uh, of the rapper, I forget his name, but the, the, the song Gangnam Style. And uh, no one's singing or dancing right now. Um, I read an article about this, so I think we're all, how many of you are familiar with this, okay? Um, I'll be honest, I saw the video, I just couldn't understand it the first time I saw it on YouTube, okay? It was a phenomenon, okay? It, had, it was the most, it was one of the fastest growing viral videos ever to hit YouTube, and it was about nothing, okay? And then I read this article, and listen to what it says. I know this, the print is small on the screen, but I'll read it. It says, this was, this was by just a news analyst, it said, uh, Gangnam Style may be just a ton of fun and nothing more, but I believe its very nothingness is what makes it so wildly historically popular, and that, is, and that its popularity says something concerning our collective psyche. If, if blues and soul spoke uh, to people in pain, struggling to find love and freedom, if rock and roll spoke, and this is not a Christian, by the way, if rock and roll spoke to a generation ready for rebellion, then Gangnam Style speaks to a generation ready for nothing. He says, I know, I know, people will say I'm making too much of a hit song. People will say it no means nothing but, uh, that this will have been watched a billion times by Christmas. That's the point. It means exactly nothing and is the most popular song in history. Let, let me tell you this. We're in bad shape when we value nothingness. And I'm telling you, some teens and our youth groups represented here today get more excited about a song about nothing than they do about something substantive from God's word. And we value nothing. You know, you know what our contribution is to society, our generation? We gave society uh, two new words this last year. Uh, twerk and selfie. That's what we've contributed to society. Okay? And that's our value. We're not... Those are the things we value. Those are the things that we find as interesting. And I'm telling you guys, uh, some in this room potentially are in very bad shape because their society, their, their values are, are opposed to the values given in God's word. They're completely uh, contradictory to God's word and their value, nothing, meaningless. Listen, this conference is about a higher call. It's not about just meaningless fun. You can have meaningless fun at your home with your friends. This conference is about a higher call. There's, there's a lot more to life than just meaningless nonsense. Will you answer the higher call. And to do that, you must value the things that God values. Psalms 119, 37 says this, Turn away mine eyes from beholding vanity, and quicken thou me in the way. May that be our prayer this morning. God, would you turn my eyes away from the things that are worthless? That is what a, con a conference like this is all about. God, would you give me clarity? I want to hear your call. And I've heard others say, I want to hear God's call. Would you pray that God would give you clarity? But part of the reason that you may be potentially not hearing God's call is because your hearts are focused on what the Bible said is vanity. It's just meaningless, empty noise. And would you pray 
this morning and throughout the conference, God, would you help turn my heart from things that are vain, things that are empty, things that are meaningless, towards things that are eternal and things that are truly valuable. So will I establish my values based on God's word? Thoroughly. Write this down. Will I act with courage when God leads? Will I act with courage with God when God leads? I believe one of the reasons that people tune out God is because they'll be afraid of what he'll say to them. I bet that happened last night, even, even during a message. You know, the games, I'm in tune, I'm engaged, uh, the drama, I'll pay attention for that. And then the message comes, and I, I really do believe that there are some that just simply turn, turned it off in their minds. They turn down the volume because they're afraid of what God has to say. They're afraid of that total surrender and that complete trust. I read this, uh, this story, this is a year or so ago, I saw this on the news, this lady, her name was Laverne Everett. She's 80 years old, okay? And she decided on her 80th birthday that she wanted to go skydiving, okay? So she, she goes and uh, she signs up for the class, 80 years old, you know, I give her credit for, 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 for doing that. But here's what happened next. She, right before, the moment before she uh, jumped out of the plane, Man, she got cold feet and she didn't want to go. Well, the policies of the skydiving company is you can't go up on the plane and not jump. Once you're in the plane, you're jumping, you're going. And literally what happened in this case, they start to push her out. But at 80 years old, she, she was a fighter, okay? She was not going out. She had a death grip on the door. You can watch this video on YouTube. She's got this death grip on the door and she did not want to go. And they're pushing her and they're pushing her. How many guys said, that's mean, you know, that's an old lady. Let, let her just go down. Well, they did not let her just go down and they pushed her and pushed her. But, but in the struggle to get her out the door, many of her straps became untied and loose. So he's pushing her and pushing her, the skydiving instructor. And while she's, while she's fighting it, her straps to her parachute are becoming loose. And I think we have the next slide here. She literally is hanging by her knees and the instructor is holding her arm and holding her knee and she, she didn't make it. Just kidding, she was fine. But, <laughs> some of the girls are crying. Let me tell you this, she was fine, but it was, it was, it was, it was a scary situation to say the least and, and she'll never go skydiving again, I'm, I'm sure. Just barely hanging on there. But you know what? I, I think of that picture with that. She's just holding on for dear life. I, I think that's how some people are at a conference, you know? They hear a message on God's words like, I'm not going. I'm not going. I'm going to sit here and I'm going to fight it. I'm not going to go. My youth pastor, you cannot push me out. You cannot do this. I'm not going. And the reason is because they know. They don't have the courage to act when God leads. And listen, Moses, he did eventually experience God's leading in an incredible way. Did you think of how he was led through the wilderness and God opened some incredible doors for him, like parting the Red Sea. But he had to have the courage to take the first steps. He had to have the courage to act when God leads. The Bible says this, verse number 27, look here. By faith he forsook Egypt, not fearing the wrath of the king. The king was powerful. The king was, was a big presence in Moses' life, the Pharaoh. But let me tell you this, there was a bigger presence. And there was someone that he feared more with a godly fear and a godly respect. And that was his God. And so when it came time, he said, listen, I, I will not fear the king when I, forsake is when I forsake Egypt. I will fear my God, not fearing the king. I love Joseph's or Joshua's challenge in the book of Joshua. Only be thou strong and very courageous. Let me challenge some of you this week to pray, going into some of the messages that you'll hear. God, speak to my heart and give me the courage to respond. I even think a simple act of coming forward and kneeling at an altar is, is one expression of that courage. I was talking to some of our teens in our youth group, and, and you know what, sometimes we make big decisions and then we won't even go forward to make a big decision in our life. We won't take those, those little steps of action because of fear for others, fear for what others would think. And, and, and Moses simply came to the point in his life where he said, I will not fear the king. The king had the power in an instant to end his life. But Moses said, there's someone that I fear greater than the king, and that is my God. The Bible says this, for my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are my ways 
Your ways, my ways, saith the Lord. And God's ways are different. Uh, they're higher. They're better, the Bible tells us. And so will you act with courage when God leads you, when God prompts your heart? Listen, let me, let me encourage you. If God speaks to your heart this week, don't ignore the call or try to silence the call or say, we'll take care of this later. Would you answer that call and act with courage when God leads you? And whatever it is, it may, be, it may be even at a youth conference like this that God would call someone to the mission field. God would call someone to full-time service. God would call you to make another decision that maybe takes some courage. Will you act with fear? Will you, will you act with courage instead of fear when the point of decision comes? I believe sometimes there's, there's not clarity because we don't have the courage to trust and we don't have the courage to follow through on a decision. What, what good does it do to know God's will in your life if you're not going to follow it? And so Moses, he had to have the courage to take the one step. And honestly, when you read through his life in the book of Exodus, it seems almost like one step at a time. God opens the next door, and Moses walks through it, and God opened. He wasn't a perfect man. He made a lot of mistakes too, but, but God would open a door, and he would lead a nation. God would open a door, he would lead a nation. Nowhere was Moses given an entire set of plans, A to B. Here's, you know, Egypt, here's the promised land, here's the route you're going to take, and here's every good thing and bad thing that I'm allowed to happen. No, he took one step at a time, but he had the courage to take those steps. Will you act with courage? When God leads. And then finally, ask yourself this question. Write this down. Will I trust God even when I can't see his plan? Look at verse number 27. By faith he forsook Egypt, not fearing the wrath of the king, for he endured. And, and we, could, we could develop that if we had more time. But he, he was enduring. He had patience. But look at the last part of this verse. As seeing him who is invisible as seeing him who is invisible. I love this verse the more I think about it. Because everything that Moses had experienced in Egypt was, was tangible. He could touch it. It was visible. You could see it. You could see the wealth. You could see the sin as well. But he could see it. It was tangible. But when it came time for Moses to trust, he decided to trust in the hand of an unseen God. He trusted what he hadn't seen more than what he had seen. And I believe this is where a lot of us, we, we talk about God's will and, okay, my identity, my acceptance, I'm gonna, or my values, I'm going to understand that I'm accepted, I'm going I'm to establish my values, uh, I'm going to act with courage. But then, and, and this is where decisions look great on paper, and they look great in a conference notebook. But will you trust God? Will you follow through as he leads? Even when you don't know where he's taking you. Even when you don't know where this is going. This is a theme that is repeated throughout many stories in Scripture. I think it's Abraham. God called him to offer his son Isaac. And he said, get up and go. And when you get up and go, I'll tell you where you should go next. And that's often how God deals with us. But will I trust God even when I can't see his plan? I believe many, a good teenager has made a decision at a youth conference or a camp, <clears throat> and they were sincere in that decision. But when they began to act with courage, they didn't necessarily see God lead as they thought they would, and their trust begins to waver, and then they step back and revert to just how things were because they wouldn't commit their trust fully to God. Will you trust God even when you can't? see his plan. As I said a minute ago, God's ways are higher than ours. God's thoughts are higher than ours, but they're good thoughts. Uh, Jeremiah 29 verse 11 tells us that he has good plans. He has good intentions for our hearts and for our life. And he wants to bless us. And, 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 and life with Christ, following the precepts in God's word, you avoid uh, the, 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 the emptiness of sin that Moses avoided. But will you trust God even when you can't see his plan? even when you can't see his, his working. I, I think of uh, Joseph. We studied Joseph in our team Bible study a few months ago. Joseph, really, the truth be told, he had more uh, downs than he had ups. Uh, you say sometimes life is full of ups and downs. Joseph had way more downs than he had ups. 
He had a lot of things that were terrible in his life, but, but all the while, God was working and God was sovereign. I don't know, there might be someone in here who's experienced a difficulty or a disappointment or a tragedy in your life, and you're like, I do not, I cannot see how God can work through this. Maybe, maybe it's even caused your faith to waver a bit. Well, you come back as Moses did and say, I'm going to trust that which I cannot see over the things that I can see. I will trust God's hand. I will trust his moving. So let's review real quick. Four questions to ask yourself. If you got your notes, uh, let's, let's go through them together. First question is this. Will I accept my identity as a believer? Will I accept my identity as a believer? Next, will I establish my values? Will I value the things given to me in Scripture above everything that this world has to offer? Will I act with courage when God prompts me to lead? And when he leads and I begin to follow, will I trust him for every step of the way? That's only a part of Moses' story. You can continue reading in, verse, uh, in the verses to follow, but God led him through the Red Sea and, and gave him some incredible victories. But listen, before that burning bush experience, Moses settled some things in his heart. Could it be that maybe God's call isn't clear in your life because you haven't settled these same issues? Let me challenge you this morning, even, even in this hour, because you'll hear another message and you'll hear another one tonight, Brother Skelly's coming in, to settle these questions even before the next next message that you hear. God, I want, to, I, I want to establish my values. I want to accept my identity. Give me the courage and give me the trust and the faith to follow you. Let's bow our heads, close our eyes.